Good morning, good evening, or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us in the world. Welcome or welcome back to the 2020 Sense Nano Symposium, the body at all scales. Sense Nano is the first center of excellence enabled by MIT Nano, with a focus on sensors, sensing systems, and approaches for sensing to make sense of the world, whether it be in understanding our environment, or our agricultural systems, or our manufacturing systems, or this year, life in the body at all scales. The symposium this year is co-sponsored by the Industrial Liaison Program, IMES, the Institute for Medical Engineering and Science, the MIT Clinical Research Center, and MIT Nano. I'd like to introduce Vladimir Bulovich, the founding director of MIT Nano, to offer his words for the day. Hello, it is a great uh, honor for me to be able to welcome you to the third day of Sense.Nano. Uh, we as MIT Nano look forward into translating academic discoveries into true impact in the world. And hence today, you will find sessions that talk about translation, translation of those great academic ideas into ideas that could be grown and given to millions, hence, charting the path of innovation from its infancy to this distribution to the broad general public. I have, cannot but tremendously emphasize the absolute need of that translation in providing impact uh, by the works of academic institutions like ours. Impact indeed is the key to what we judge our successes with. Publish works, patents, those are great impacts. Our people that we graduate, those are the best impacts. And those people together with those ideas, translating them into the value to the world is the key of our existence. <laughs> so I wish you a fantastic afternoon, morning, evening, as you join us uh, right now. And I'll pass it back to Brian, who will introduce the sessions that will follow. Thank you for being with us. Vladimir. Thank you very much, and thank you for your words and joining us this morning, or this afternoon or evening. Sensing is how we make sense of the world. Sense is how we observe life, how we make sense of our vital signs, how we move, how we interact. Sensing is how we make our decisions for healthcare, for investment, and understanding the impact of our decisions on the world. For this symposium, we've organized around the body at all scales, around life at all scales. In the first two days, we heard technical innovations, scientific innovations at the cellular level, at the organ level, at the body level, and at the population level. Today, we continue that journey in understanding the, the impact of those innovations and the needs for no, new innovations in our various healthcare, or economic or social systems? What are the needs that we haven't been addressing? How are innovations moved into practice? How are translations happening into startup companies to create vibrant products, vibrant solutions for our healthcare providers? And what are the experiences and lessons that we're actively learning right now in addressing the needs for COVID? We'll also hear throughout the day a little bit of sneak peeks of research happening from our, our graduate students. And we'll see a fly through of the MIT Nano uh, facility, the buildings right in the heart of MIT's campus that enables many of the innovations that you've heard about and that you'll continue to hear about. I'd like to introduce our first panel or our first panelists, needs and innovations. Our panel discussants are Professor Michael Sima, who is also the Associate Dean for Innovation at MIT, Professor Amy Moran Thomas, an anthropologist at MIT studying the history and context of medical device innovations, Professor Timothy Swagger, who is also the chair of the, the faculty lead for the Deshpande Center, instrumental in the startup ecosystem around MIT. I will have each of the panelists do a little bit of an introduction 
to themselves. I'll be the slide advancer. And then I'll frame a discussion. Um, I welcome questions from the participants from the audience. And we'll have, a, I think, a very uh, vibrant series of short little vignette presentations from our panelists and some discussion. So with that, I'd like to introduce Professor Michael Sima. Actually, my first slide was just a placeholder to just tell you about uh, uh, the innovation ecosystems at MIT, but uh, the, in particular the Innovation Initiative, which is a, sort of a joint project between School of Engineering and the Sloan School, and uh, where we really have four main activities. Uh, first is education, second is ideas to impact, third is communication, and the final one is equity in translation. And um, that second one about ideas to impact is really new ways to fund translational uh, activities at MIT. And we've done a lot of experiments there and have some very interesting stories to tell, but that's different. Brian, if you go to the next slide, um, let me preface this slide by saying I've been at MIT 34 years. I've been involved in translation all that time, started numerous companies, uh, but uh, this includes diagnostics companies. And in particular, uh, 13 years ago, I started a company called T2 Biosystems. That's a uh, molecular diagnostics company. And I've learned a lot in that process. So this idea of sensing, I'm a big believer in diagnostics in particular, uh, First off, if you want to lower healthcare costs, part of that is bringing the right medical service to the right patient. And I've often asked myself, how do you do that without diagnostics? And so, um, so I'm a big believer in it. It's a challenging area to build a business, but I've learned a lot. Uh, and the first is in diagnostics or sensing, if you will. Well, I should say I'm referring to regulated medical products. This is not, this is one where you know, the FDA would have to approve it. And, and there, those types of products need to be based on providing clinically meaningful information. That is, the, a clinician is going to make a clinically significant decision about how to care for a patient based on the results of this test, if you will. And uh, I see a lot of early stage ideas that spend most of their time trying to figure out exactly what that decision is. And uh, what I've learned is you have to start with the decision to build the technology. The second is something that's particularly important in an era full of molecular diagnostics. These are exquisitely sensitive and highly specific tests that can be uh, developed. But as you get more and more specific, the prevalence decreases. Uh, and as a result, acceptance is often challenged because hospitals and clinicians are hesitant to order tests where the vast majority of the tests turn out negative. Uh, they worry that in a prevalence, let's say the MIT community, uh, the prevalence of COVID is down at like 0.04% or something like that of the positive tests done. The vast majority of the tests are negative. So in other words, the positive results could be easily outnumbered by false positives, even with a high, very high specificity. Physicians and hospitals hate that. So it's really um, very difficult to have both the high specificity and a commercially successful test simply because of the acceptance may get in the way of the prevalence. And then finally, a lot of us, especially on the technology side, um, go, develop their new technology with the thinking that the competition is other technology or an existing technology. And it turns out that's not always the case. In infectious disease, uh, which I have a lot of experience, so um, particularly bacterial sepsis, uh, it's a killer disease, uh, but, um, and the, the testing protocol 
is really blood culture, which is a terrible test. I mean, it's just absolutely abysmal as far as whether it really tells you whether the patient is, is ill or not. Or secondly, that you get it in a timely fashion because it usually takes several days. Um, it turns out that's not the competition. The competition is what physicians normally do, which is in what's called empiric therapy. They have a protocol. Patient has a, patient has a fever, you administer this drug, the fever doesn't resolve, you do this drug. And the truth is, that is fairly effective. Yes, it misses patients, but it turns out that's your competition. It's, interestingly enough, that protocol is different in every hospital. So your competition in introducing this new technology is different in every hospital. So you have to make a case in every hospital. So it, this is, these are the kind of hurdles that need to be considered really early in the, I'd say even in the research phase to develop these new technologies, sensing technologies, medical diagnostics. As a cultural anthropologist of medicine, I teach on the social lives of medical objects here at MIT. Um, and we try to equip our students with tools to ask, what are the assumptions built into a given device, um, often unintentionally? And how is tech actually working you know, between people in the world? So my ethnographic work usually involves learning from patients and caregivers um, about how they interact with medical objects. Um, but in the case study I'll mention here today, just to give you an, an example of this approach, um, it was actually my husband who was in the role of technology user. He was managing a COVID diagnosis this spring um, and we kind of joined the many frightened people um, waiting at home, trying to make the right calls about when to go to the hospital uh, when he had trouble breathing. So you see him in the photo here. Um, wearing a pulse ox as it read 92, uh, which is the exact number marking the threshold when you're supposed to go to the ER. Um, so these objects are being positioned in you know, new ways in these times of uncertainty. And I started trying to learn a bit about what this number meant and where it came from, uh, both as a concerned family member and a medical anthropologist who um, you know, teaches on medical objects. So it turned out that the cheap uh, contact it, a device that I had bought for $25 at a corner pharmacy right here in Cambridge um, exceeds the FDA guidelines, even though it doesn't have to as a home device, um, but it has an arm of less than three, is this error measurement. Um, and so for our household where everyone was white, um, it met and exceeded FDA guidelines. But I also learned that for people with darker skin, many of the far more expensive devices um, that are in hospitals actually didn't meet the same FDA threshold uh, according to the most recent published data. Um, so the FDA guidelines even today still allow for de device testing on um, mostly white groups of up to 85% um, white people. So even today, there can still be these subtle errors uh, that get reproduced for non-white people. So I was surprised when I read about this and I reached out to the study authors. Um, if we could go to the next slide here. Um, so Philip Bickler and colleagues uh, at UCSF, um, they were trying to assess uh, these biases and their testing found that they're generally too slight for a doctor or user to tell if something was off. Uh, they could be anywhere between one and 8% depending on oxygen saturation, but there is getting worse at lower saturations. Um, but at common cutoff points, they're just tiny enough that it would be almost impossible for a doctor to tell if there was something misleading, um, but just significant enough that at times they could matter in these subtle but potentially insidious ways. Um, so to take the threshold um, shown on this graph as an example, it illustrates the finding um, from the Bickler group's research that an actual blood oxygen saturation of 88 um, would um, in a general population be estimated at around 90 on a pulse ox. But for people with darker skin, this reading would be 91. Um, so the, uh, this matters because the general rule of thumb for getting oxygen in a hospital is at 90, not at 91. Um, so these are just you know, loose working guidelines and one hopes that um, you know, physicians would be able to navigate around them. Um, 
but they mean more than they otherwise might because of everything we know about implicit biases and inadvertent medical racism already at work in hospitals uh, where black, indigenous, and other people of color really um, you know, are more likely to have distress of all kinds go undertreated in many areas of healthcare. Um, so the small company known in which made this graph of the UCSF data, um, I think has been a leader in trying to invest in the issue and they note they still have further to go. Um, but I appreciate that this data is publicly available on their website. Um, I see that as kind of a model of transparency that I hope more manufacturers ahead will take inspiration from. Um, because when errors go unacknowledged, um, bias measures can get built into our healthcare systems. So Medicare, for example, will reimburse at 89, but not 90 um, based on the pulse ox reading. So even tiny errors can create situations potentially where people with darker skin may sometimes need to be sicker in order to receive treatment. Um, pulse ox data is often also being used now to guide closed loop algorithms that optimize ventilators. Um, and being fed to a variety of algorithms used in hospital decision making, such as EPIC, um, some of which involve AI. So that raises the questions of what, what will machines learn if we feed them um, you know, racially distorted data? Um, and uh, this can even cloud our scientific understandings of disease. So I'm um, ha happy to talk more about that if it's of interest in our discussion. But I think the errors uh, graphed here are only um, isolating the errors due to skin color calibrations in the device. Um, but others can be due to gender, for example, devices not fitting well um, for the finger geometry of women, um, errors due to nail polish, circulation issues due to chronic conditions. Um, so for example, for a woman of color who's been dealing with diabetes and arrives at an ER wearing nail polish, there could be four different types of errors that compound, only one of which is shown on this graph. So I think the bottom line here is that we never know exactly when slight biases built into devices could come to matter in someone's lived reality. Um, but because they have the foreseeable potential to amplify existing disparities in our social realities today, it matters to clarify any confusion about whether errors have been fixed, to what degree, in which models, um, and not just in the pulse ox, but in any non-invasive um, technology. So as an anthropologist, I can't remake devices personally, um, but I'm glad to be here in conversation um, with those of you whose work on the technical side of these fields has the, the potential to uh, address these things because color sensing, I think, is just one example um, of how a social assumption can unconsciously get encoded into health technology. But I hope that having dialogues about issues like this is uh, a step toward coming together to try to make sure similar disparities aren't built into the next generation of medical devices. My research effort, I'm in the Department of Chemistry, really focuses largely on designing new materials and really applying you know, chemical principles to, to what we can do to do that in a, in a very broad way. And that's what this first slide is, is indicating. There's examples of, uh, in some of the videos of, of dynamic systems that are optical systems of liquid crystals, uh, with uh, exfoliation of graphite electrochemically to make graphene, um, essentially low defect graphene, kind of a bulk scale, which can be useful for electrodes, for example, uh, different types of chemical resistor devices, actuators, things that mechanically can move with uh, stimuli and, uh, and ways to detect uh, you know, viruses and, 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 uh, and bacteria. So, uh, we started at a fairly fundamental level, and, and one of the things that is, is kind of the, I would say, the enduring project in our group has always been, uh, how do we make a better sensor, better biosensor? It's been our lead application throughout the years. And uh, I always come at this from the fact that I believe we're really in a materials limited world. We need, you, if you're going to detect something, you need an observable change. And, and so what we focus on is how do we make these transduction materials? How do we put the chemistry, biochemistry, material science all together to give us, whether it's a change in resistivity or an optical change or change in, you know, its impedance. We can do all of these different things, but how do we think about that from a molecular level? And then when you get there, you have to think, uh, you know, if we're going to do, you know, real world stuff like Amy and Michael were just talking about, you have to have a robust system, which 
you know, it has, it's stable. It gives you the right answer time and time again. Um, it's sensitive enough. Uh, you know, the sensitivity will vary depending on what you're looking at. And, uh, but it also has to have selectivity. If you have something that's really sensitive and it's responding to everything, you're just amplifying noise. And so, so really trying to think about how we design systems at that level is where we come at things. And we, we also work hard at, um, transition, transition our chemistry or our methods to the real world and have some successes in the startup space, um, around gas sensing and, and more, most recently around uh, bacterial sensing. Um, Anyway, this is what you know. My research group is, is focused on, uh, and one of the overlying goals I think that will be relevant today is we we try and make everything uh, easy enough to measure that perhaps you could do a ubiquitous technology. And by ubiquitous technology, you know we have to just, we have to think about a smartphone. Uh, that's that's the computer we all have that has RF in it. It has cameras. I could have many other things. And so uh, we think a lot about how we can create systems that can interface with that. So, um, and Brian, as you also mentioned, I'm the faculty director of the Spondy Center. If you can go to the next slide on that. Um, what I, uh, this slide is really just in, intended to kind of give you a, a slight overview of the center. Uh, we uh, basically are the kind of lab to startup conduit. We work with faculty members and their, their postdocs and graduate students to transition uh, inventions that are in the laboratory, um, their associate laboratory, the, the principal investigator of the program has to be uh, uh, somebody who is saying can be a principal investigator, usually a faculty member or a very senior research staff member. And, uh, and now our job is to help connect them with uh, the community, help them refine their ideas through different market analysis and, and, uh, and also supply some financing. So we, we give out grants that help finance uh, these efforts. And this all fits very nicely into uh, the other larger MIT activities. Uh, we have an educational component, which uh, as Michael mentioned, the innovation initiative, that's our kind of a flagship educational component around uh, entrepreneurship and innovation, but we, we, we interface with with him on, on, on that. And in fact, as I kind of consider us a subset of the innovation initiative, um, we interact uh, a lot with the engine. We, we view ourselves as kind of the fuel for the engine or try am I helping MIT create more fuel for the engine, which is MIT's incubator and uh, venture capital uh, uh, arm that's, that's helping to promote local innovation. And then uh, we're also very interested in uh, the ongoing industrial uh, MIT partnership. And uh, as you all know, um, the in industrial liaison program has really been uh, uh, undoubtedly the most successful engagement between industry and universities uh, in the country. It's a, it's a program very established now. Um, it really uh, helps us to connect to industry uh, it, you know, bringing industrial companies through, uh, at times they're, they're seeding ideas, they're telling us what they need. And that helps the, the, the you know, the pull, the technology pull that I think a lot of us really need to understand what we can do in our laboratories that will make a difference for industry. And so um, the Sponde Center and what we do at MIT really, really hinges on a number of these different institutions. It's not just one thing with the Sponde Center that I'm heading is actually a, a, a kind of central in all of that. We'll, we'll take the conversation um, how you want to take it. But let me try to frame it a little bit with a hypothesis that you can challenge or support or let us know where we need to fill in the gaps. In recent decades, the majority of innovation in healthcare has been centered on the development of new diagnostic procedures, therapies, drugs, or medical devices, and the U.S. has excelled at that. These advances range from new pharmaceutical agents, um, stents that we heard from Elzar Edelman on the first day, uh, precise diagnostic scanners and surgical robots and surgical tools. And we've produced phenomenal, stunning results from this. Going forward though, the emphasis on innovation promises to accelerate rapidly and produce phenomenal exponential change in areas including prevention, personalized care, tailored to the patient's gene genetic information, uh, and their needs, 
more efficient proactive technologies enabled for different care models or integrated and comprehensive delivery in organizational designs, creative technologies for healthcare and managing healthcare encounters, whether it be between patient and provider, provider to provider, or patient to patient. The need, the question maybe, or the hypothesis, the need to manage cohorts of patients with chronic conditions will lead healthcare organizations to invest in consumer-facing devices, mobile apps, wearables, remote monitoring tools, and virtual care. This, in turn, will lead to more demand for sensors, data, and data analytics capabilities to support population health management initiatives. And now we have COVID in the near term and, and maybe the long term with maybe similar needs. So that's a little bit of the framing. Um, I guess the first question to kick it off, um, agree or disagree? You know, what are the big problems with this vision? Or um, what do we do to enable this vision? Uh, I, a couple of things came to mind. You, you mentioned a lot of things. Uh, if, I, if my colleagues don't mind, uh, I'll jump in. But the, um, uh, you know, where I'm seeing these things appear, particularly, you know, personalized data acquisition systems, you know, the Fitbit type thing, is our surprising places. So risk stratification on elective surgery, there are a lot of now significantly, or, you know, large experiments, I guess, uh, that started with pilot experiments, but now they're reasonable sized trials where uh, patients that are indicated for an elective surgery uh, wear an activity monitor in the couple of weeks prior to coming to the hospital. And uh, based on that data, they can stratify the patient as uh, where, what risk profile they present for that surgery. So uh, they can, you know, a sedentary person, not to su surprisingly, surprisingly, is is at much higher risk for bad outcomes in a surgery than a person that's active. And so they can plan on having that patient stay longer in the hospital, plan on it uh, before they uh, let them go home. And the reason for that, as you know, there's the, the, uh, there's a rule now that CMS is if you have come, you're released from the hospital and have to come back within a certain time, the hospital has to pay for it, not CMS and uh, because it's considered a medical error. And these experiments are showing that, that, that this kind of bio, uh, biomarker data is important in making decisions like that. And uh, I think it'll, you'll see it there first because this is serious money that, that we're talking about here and measurements, anything that increase the odds that you do a better job of discharging the patient at the right time has a, bottom line impact on the hospital. So that's a typical example of how we're seeing this deployed. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Amy or Tim, anything you want to pick up on either what Michael said or response to the, the framing? Um, I, I can offer a few thoughts, um, you know, just from speaking with people living with chronic conditions, one refrain I hear kind of time and again is that more advanced technology isn't necessarily better care, you know, and um, so in addition to technological innovation, I really believe in the idea of socio-technical innovation, you know, trying to think with the insights that patients and doctors and other users can offer when asked, you know, um, trying to listen and make more responsive technologies that uh, can address some of the additional concerns that they raise about design. Um, so for example, surveillance is not always wanted by patients, you know, which can lead to unwillingness to engage with healthcare systems at all if there's a sense that there's not a sort of control of um, data privacy or other kind of user decisions. Um, and yeah, whenever I hear about a breakthrough, I kind of ask myself, for whom, you know, and um, who will it reach, who does it work for, and, and how, how can we offer the options that people uh, want? Yeah, no, I think, Amy, you brought up a number of good, good points that, you know, the, where things can go wrong. I've always thought that we need more data on, on everybody, more informatics, because there's, there's it's this, a lot of times healthcare data is very noisy, and then 
And how do you do that with a population that may, you know, see a downside to it, at least an individual downside. And that's a real thing. And it's and privacy is very important. I do think there are places where um, if we can move monitoring from the hospital to the home, uh, we can, we can do a lot and just give you one, one thing that's been on my mind. It was a concept we're working on in collaboration with Be Bevan Ingleward in bioengineering. And she really brought this to my attention and it has to do with immunotherapy. So when you get a cancer treatment, one way is to activate your immune system. And if you uh, don't activate it enough, you're not getting, you know, the full benefit of the treatment, but if you overactivate it, you can, you know, cause complications or even kill a person by having their immune system be overactive. So, um, so when you're, you're doing these, there has to be kind of a conservative, you know, treatment, bringing people in every couple of weeks, checking their, their different enzyme levels to make, to see how, you know, much their immune system's been stimulated. But if they had things at home where they could basically say, look, you know, I'm not getting, you know, good enough dose here. I didn't get enough or, I, or I'm a little too heavy. Uh, if they could do this at home and do an immune uh, monitoring, or they're just through some bodily fluid, they could do it at home reproducibly. They could optimize their cancer treatment. And so I think there are lots of little, it's just one little nugget that she came up with, but I think there are lots of things like that that um, that can make a difference and save on hospital trips, allow uh, therapies to be more uh, efficient, effective uh, in the future. So there, there's just, it's a complicated system, amazingly complicated. And there's gonna be little beachheads that maybe uh, appear over time. Um, and it can take a long time though to get everything uh, transitioned. So your, your questions are sort of making uh, sort of a, a theme or a sort of a, a um, maybe a problem. Um, so we want to get more um, data in, in the context of, of daily living, and we have to deal with the noisy data. But I'm struck maybe first with, with Michael's comment about sort of the risk stratification. Um, and it wasn't clear whether the device that was being used was actually a medical device, sort of an FDA-regulated medical device, or a Fitbit. A, a yeah, health it was. And I, I guess the, the question I have for the panel is like, how do we, how do we walk that line? Maybe a, a wellness device doesn't really care as much making sure that it's uh, appropriate for all of our diverse populations that we're just trying to sell. You know, it sort of looks like this as opposed to making medical decisions. So how, how do we take some of this wellness technology and appropriately use it, or can we? First, ask Amy. Just well, from a, a, or, or Michael, I mean, oh, go ahead, Amy. Go ahead, go ahead Michael, no. or Amy. Um, well, you know, the, the question whether it's regulated or not, the same device can be a regulated device or a, a device of convenience, right, which is not regulated. So I use the example in class of a baby monitor. Baby monitor is not regulated by the FDA. However, if you use it for a child that has, you know, has risk of SIDS, now all of a sudden that device could be a life-saving device. And uh, so in the, everything has to do with intended use. And uh, so if it's, if it's just for convenience, pulse oximeter in a healthy population is just a measure of convenience. If, if it's an ICU patient, it's no longer a measurement of convenience. Same device, whether one's regulated, the other's not. So, um, and then one other point that Amy made that, well, I've learned, you know, over a long time working on regulated products in the FDA is that the, the FDA approves devices or products, the drugs or devices on the basis of three things, patient feels better, functions better, or lives longer. And what's interesting about that is the first two are subjective. They're based on literally asking the patient. The, the last one, it's only the last that's purely objective. And so you can spend hundreds of millions of dollars developing 
a product, measuring all kinds of biomarkers to help you understand whether it's working. But in reality, in the end, you have to ask the patient. And uh, you know, to her point, a lot of work goes into what is the appropriate question to ask the patient to understand whether it's really a value to them. And it's, it's a huge part of the development of a medical product. It's very interesting. And um, I, I could build on that for a moment to say, um, you know, as an ethnographer, I think one of the things I was so struck by seeing my husband go through all that was um, that, uh, you know, there's one kind of set of um, guidelines we could talk about, you know, in relation to how devices should be used, but then the de facto way they are being used, you know, when the triage nurse talking us into the hospital, you know, is asking if it's at 93 or 92. Um, you know, also I think raises a bigger question about how do we just have more dialogue about, you know, some devices might have certain limits, but I think the more that people talk about them and are aware of them, you know, whether it's care providers or other users, um, then they can be negotiated with the kind of appropriate grain of salt. Um, and then, you know, when it comes to the FDA guidelines, I think the um, Bickler Group's work at UCSF is really interesting just as a model, how they assessed um, bias is something that I hope one day will be built into the FDA and ISO regulations themselves, you know, um, just trying to make sure that uh, all the devices that end up in hospitals work equally well um, for each subgroup that um, is going to be using it, not just when the data is kind of blended back into uh, a larger statistic set. So having a bit of our own statistics as opposed to a population Based statistic. Tim, was there? And I think I think all all been great things said by Michael and, and Amy. And uh, when I think about this, I just think about what the what the individuals will will accept in terms of you know how evasive things can be. Now you know we have a we have our smartphone tell us how many how many step footsteps we took in a day. I don't think we all view that as evasive, right? It's just something we activate. It's kind of fun look at um, maybe having a wristband that you know measures your electrolyte or your metabolites in your sweat could be the same uh, if it's not uncomfortable or maybe we go all the way to breath so there's going to be a lot of a lot of room for where you know how this all evolves with public acceptance and, and what people are willing to have if they want ubiquitous monitoring of their health and uh, I think it's probably going to be age dependent too. Younger people may not, unless they have a pre existing condition, may not, not be so interested in, unless they're working out really hard and they want to see how, you know, kind of monitor their body for how good of a training they got, for example. But uh, it's going to be a, it's, it's going to be a complex ecosystem, there's no question. There was a, a question that came in here. Oh, it moved for a second. Um, oh. Where do we go from here, I think is the question. Um, where do we go from here for personal medical devices? It seems like everyone is getting to the same area, pulse ox, heart rate, blood pressure. Where do you see technology going to build more into these types of devices for personal medical monitoring? And what are the biggest life monitoring things that aren't being measured that would actually provide what we need? Something well, I spoke about this the other. Yeah, I, I, I spoke about this the other day. So, I, at risk of repeating myself, I have a big interest in hydration status. Uh, there is uh, not a good way to know whether you're euvolemic or not. Whether you have too much water or too little water. Yet, the third largest or most frequent uh, reason for hospitalization is dehydration, and um, and whole range of conditions where your kidneys don't function correctly and you have too much water. And um, if there was a way to monitor this inexpensively yet clinically relevantly, you know, have a clinically relevant measurement, it would be a vital sign. It would not, it would be just like blood pressure. It would be just like body temperature it, because it is so much a part of how, how I'm, you know, an integral part of how you maintain homeostasis, how your body actually uh, 
is optimized is having the right amount of water. And um, so, um, you know, I have a couple of ideas, but it's been a graveyard of companies out there and technologies to do that um, because they've all proven very difficult to, to, uh, to actually sh demonstrate clinically relevant measurements. Everybody have some more water, I guess is the answer, as appropriate. Drink, drink right now. <laughs> Yeah, um, I, this also makes me think of some of what I've seen around uh, diabetes care technologies. You know, I think the Pulse Ox is one example of, um, you know, a, a range of devices like blood pressure cuffs that don't fit on people's arms, blood glucose meters that don't read over certain numbers, um, prosthetic device interfaces that only work for like athletes or accident survivors when most um, people who are dealing with uh, amputations um, have them you know, uh, sustain them through chronic diseases like diabetes. And so I think there are all kinds of ideals about body types and gender norms and racialized expectations that get built into devices. Um, and I, um, I don't think while addressing them alone, you know, is um, just a reflection of these much bigger ways those inequalities are part of our social fabrics. I, I do think that better accounting um, for those realities in design can help um, contribute to the recognition and survival of patients seeking healthcare, um, or at least trying to not amplify those systemic inequalities that so many people are already navigating. So in addition to the, the sensing technology with to figure out what's the right impedance match, the, the mechanical matching or the electrical matching or the size, shape, form, and fit to the individuals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, I, I think a lot of these things have to do also, if you're going to move beyond just, you know, the standard vital signs, as Mike, Michael was saying, into other things like hydration or, or different different aspects, is how do you sample in a way that people will accept? I mean, I don't think we want to take urine samples from ourselves every day, well, but, but if you had something that was in your tooth, toothbrush, maybe that would be okay. You had a way of monitoring saliva through a toothbrush that could be a good way or even your breath through your toothbrush yeah i have, smart, smart I have toothbrush. a toothbrush go ahead michael yes please yeah. yeah there are a lot of we were speaking about risk stratification there are a lot of diseases where um there's a relatively small population that is at much greater risk than others and be able to differentiate those people conveniently and non-invasively, uh, as, as Tim was talking about, is a big deal. I, mean, I have a paper just accepted. I just got the acceptance notice today on on uh, differentiating f fatty liver, which is about 20 to 5 to 30 percent of the American population. It's reversible, right? If you lose weight, you will get better. But the uh, but a small portion of those people have inflammation significant enough in the liver that it becomes fibrotic and ultimately it can lead to liver failure and uh, and even worse outcomes and so the you know being able to find those people out of you know so like a, a small number of all the people that have um, you know fatty liver you know is is a real medical challenge uh, right now, that fibrotic reaction is only uh, determined by a liver biopsy, so in a very invasive procedure. So if there was one way you could do it non-invasively in the doctor's office, it would be part of the screening. That It would definitely be part of the screening in the American population because of the high incidence of obesity. Very good. So liver health and hydration smart toothbrush. So we, we, ha we have some business plans to, to write here. Uh, I, I guess the, we're, as we're getting close to the end, uh, maybe just two more questions. Um, real quick, maybe around the table, is COVID helping or hurting our ability to innovate and, and get these technologies out and get new technologies and create sort of answer some of these questions? I, I would say it's it's helping, but that's my 
because I think we've become more efficient. We've been able to use different resources. It's pushed us to think differently. Um, I think we're going to end up with, there is going to be some silver lining to this. That's my view, but uh, maybe, maybe it is what, painful. What is that silver right lining? What are the silver linings? In addition to helping your hurting, what are those silver linings you're seeing? Well, I think we can give you, I think that there are going to be some efficiency gains in how you operate and do things. I wouldn't want to be in, you know, commercial office real estate right now. I think that's probably going to be an area that's going to get hit. Um, but certainly in how you can inter innovate and communicate and uh, bring teams together quickly uh, from, you know, from a very diversity of backgrounds, uh, how to, uh, to do things virtually, whether it's designing or whether it's meeting and sharing ideas. Amy or Michael, your, your perspective on COVID and its impact of the good or the bad or the ugly. Amy, are you going to? Oh, okay. Well, I, my, uh, you know, I, I very much hope Tim is correct. That it'll be a positive one. Infectious disease has not had a stellar support um, by the government or governments throughout the world. Uh, it's a really sad thing. If you look at what was required in one of the other great pandemics, the AIDS pandemic, uh, it w took a lot of private um, wealthy individuals to finally get governments to invest in it. Um, and um, we don't reimbur reimburse for things like uh, antibiotics it's, a ter it's like the worst part of the drug industry. Um, and um, and it's, it's, you know, we just need to take a different attitude on the public health aspect of this and, um, and you know, get our governments to realize that they're going to have to pay up front for, um, you know, infectious disease, reimburse for it, reimburse it, or you won't get the innovations that you need. And that and it's, it, the bill is coming due on the antibiotic front pretty soon. Yeah. yeah, one thing I'm noticing so much of is how um, you know different conditions intersect, um, and so um, so treating diabetes in places like where I worked in Belize, glucometer strips are going for a hundred dollars a vial right now because of all the COVID shortages, and so. Um, I both see how different conditions, um, you know, are coming together in ways that so far are negatively impacting people's um, access to um, different kinds of uh, sensors, for example. But also I, I think there is more public attention um, on medical conditions of all kinds in this moment. And I, I hope um, ideally that that can be harnessed to uh, address the range of chronic conditions that um, more, more attention is now being brought to. Thank you. So we're gonna we're at the close to the close, um, but I'd like to ask for a cliffhanger uh, to bring people back next time. So what's the one burning point um, or cliffhanger that you want to leave people with to inspire somebody to work with you, or to pick up their pen and paper and, and work on it themselves? Uh, we'll start with we'll go in reverse order here. So uh, Tim. Okay, I, I guess um, I'm, I'm looking at just from my own lensing for my own program. And uh, what I what would I think would help us do more is if we had more interest from computer scientists in helping us to, you know, uh, optimize sensors to understand complex responses. And, and if you look at what has been done with for example, image processing and sharpening images and, and uh, understanding um, optics, if that can be done with all different types of sensor modalities and particular fusion of different types of uh, data, uh, I think that you, there really is gonna be some rich opportunities there. So this would be something that, you know, if I could wish for breakthroughs uh, that would impact, uh, I mean, at least my vision of where I want to go in sensing, I, I think really a, 
harnessing a, a, a you know a new generation of computer scientists that will come out there and help us do all the the machine learning and AI um, that's needed to uh, to make big advances in sensors. Tim, a Amy, you're next in the round round the table here. <laughs> um, so I'm really inspired by sociologist Ruha Benjamin's. Um, insight about responding to discriminatory design. Um, so that's kind of the note I wanted to end on because she points out that like a lot of forms of discrimination, you know, design choices usually aren't deliberate exclusions, but they still reproduce these unequal chances of survival. Um, so questions like whose perspectives are represented at the lab bench, just trying to recognize um, blind spots being built into technologies to redress them. Um, making sure there are people from all perspectives kind of represented in academia and industry, engaging with people from a range of positions. Um, and one, um, I just recently learned that back in the 1970s and 80s, before I was even born, um, Hewlett Packard actually made a kind of oximeter before the pulse ox um, that was sort of beloved by physicians. Um, it was more accurate uh, for certain dynamic conditions such as viruses. Um, and it could be calibrated for each individual. Um, so uh, sort of they found a way back then to deal with um, some uh, pre preventing these racial biases. So I think that's just a reminder that this is possible, you know, um, that a lot of it just depends what questions do we um, frame, uh, use to frame our measurements and how do we learn from those histories um, to, uh, yeah, try to avoid reproducing these errors in, in the next generation of devices. Amy and Michael, your parting thought. Yeah, I guess my cliffhanger would be uh, central nervous system. Why do I say that? Well, uh, November 6th will be an FDA advisory committee meeting uh, to discuss the uh, Biogen's drug for uh, a potential drug for the treatment of Alzheimer's. That, If that drug is ends up being approved, it will be the first therapy for Alzheimer's disease. And I can say confidently that it was a 20 year effort by the entire industry built upon new innovative diagnostic technologies that could stratify patients, that could tell you who is a early risk of Alzheimer's disease so that they could populate these trials. And why I think that's the prototype of the future is that there are a lot of CNS diseases where we have no idea what the molecular mechanism of the disease is. I'm talking about things like, like schizophrenia, depression, things like this. There's a bunch of drugs for these things and they're all notoriously bad. Why? Because there's no real basic understanding of on the molecular level of what the disease is. So I think this is the most important area of diagnostics going forward. This is a, these areas represent a huge healthcare burden to, to the United States and other countries throughout the world. And um, we need to inform and so that scientists so that they can hypothesize as to really what is the basis of these diseases. I, I'm confident when I say that Things like depression is not one disease. It's the same thing with diabetes. It's not one disease. And we only call it that because we see the symptoms. We call it, we base our decision on the disease. What we really need to do is stratify the, these patient populations that have the same symptoms into those that have the same disease, the same dysregulation. And that'll be from diagnostics. Okay, that's my parting thought. Michael, thank you. Amy, thank you very much, okay. Tim. Thank you for your time and your thoughts and your work. And participants, thank you for the questions. I know we have many more that we didn't get to. That concludes the, the needs and innovation discussion.